The garden might look good behind you. I'm pretty proud of it, but there have been some serious challenges here at the homestead with some of these crops you really don't want to mess up on. So today I'm gonna to take you around a little casual tour of the garden and share some of the problems that we've experienced and what we are doing to fix it. First off though, we have to say hi to Broody Butter. She has gone broody once again. I guarantee she's in here. Yep, called it. Now watch, she's gonna fluff up. Oh, doesn't want me to touch her because she's broody. Listen to that chirp. Butter, chill, okay? Just chill. Oh my God. The first major problem has been in the garlic patch and for sure I thought this was gonna be the best garlic patch that I've ever had. I don't wanna write it off quite yet, but it has been getting hit with garlic rust. This is something that Jacques found in one of his garlic patches at his house and he gave me the heads up I ran out to check. It turns out I had some early signs of garlic rust. We've already done a pretty severe treatment. I hope and I pray it's enough to actually save this garlic because when you're growing garlic, guys, it's like 150, 180 days, six months of a year or maybe like one two hundredth of a human life. Think about it that way. You don't want to mess this garlic up. So let me take you down here and show you the signs. So first off, take a look at the tops. I really shouldn't be seeing significant browning at this point in their life. They've still got at least two months worth of growth and they're just getting absolutely fried here at the top, not because they are mature, because you will see that I'm actually not getting full bulbing. It's about to, if it had two more months, it would, but it's dying at the top while it's not super bulbed out, which means that it wasn't supposed to do that, which means something else is causing it, and that something else is garlic rust. Take a look, you've got this sort of mottled appearance here. So what we've done is come through and spray all of this with a sulfur mix. It's one of the few things that can actually control it. I'm really not a big fan of spraying anything if I can avoid it, but in this case, with this much investment and in time, love, and energy into the crop, I felt it was worth it, and we isolated it just to this area, so I'm not really too worried about any sort of cross-contamination or anything like that. Sometimes, you have gotta take measures into your own hands to save your crop. I would much rather do this than lose six months of time, and honestly, quite a bit of money buying all of these cloves and popping them in. Before we go into our next problem, let's celebrate a little success, and that would be the asparagus. It's been cut back multiple times, mulched over. You're seeing a purple asparagus come up, and over there you also have some green asparagus. So these are spears I can harvest if I want to, or I can really let this all grow out for one more season, and then next year I'll just have a boatload of asparagus coming out. All right, let's move on over to my favorite crop, the potatoes, which again are having some problems. I'm less worried about the potato issues than I am the garlic because these were already getting closer towards maturity. I planted these in November. It's about April right now, so they've had a lot of time to grow. Now, that's actually more time than a potato would normally need, but in this case, it was grown through our winter or sort of our long fall here in San Diego, so it's gonna grow slower, so that days to harvest is gonna push out. But we're just seeing some disease on these potatoes that is decimating the leaf tissue, which means that, I mean, effectively, these tubers are gonna get kind of locked at the size that they're at because there's not gonna be enough leaf tissue up top to generate energy and throw it down towards those tubers. So if you take a look here, you can see it's just getting completely obliterated. Um, you've got situations like this where, you know, that's all just coming right off. And then if we take an individual leaf, you can kind of see what's going on here. You got this sort of mottled appearance. Now there's like four or five diseases that typically hit potatoes. I believe this one is a bacterial one, might be fungal, not quite sure. But regardless, I mean, you can still see that there are potatoes in this bed. There's some potatoes right here. So I'm still gonna get potatoes. And what I've opted to do in this case is just let this crop be. I do not plan to do a spray here. Some of these are obviously less affected than others. I'm just gonna wait until this fully dies off so that all that energy does go down to the tuber and just kind of see what I get. The issues in the potato bed have made me potentially reevaluate the timing that I grow these potatoes. I was talking with Jacques a little bit and he was saying he's thinking about maybe not planting them through the winter next time and instead just maybe sowing a crop in about February or March in our season. So just basically a pure spring potato crop, maybe a late summer, early fall one, and that's about it. Pairing a failure with a success, artichokes this year, damn, are they crazy. I mean, this is just not even fully expressing how big they've, they've gotten this year. This is massive. This one's getting a little bit old, but I need to come through and do a harvest. You wanna harvest these guys when they are still kind of tight. You know, when they're starting to open up a little bit, you actually don't really wanna to see too much of that action there. This should be much closer towards the unopened flower here. But I would say this is still probably okay to harvest. Artichokes, to me, is a perfect perennial crop. I mean, look how these have exploded. 
in this part shade area, It'd probably get sun for half the day only and watered off of rainwater and laundry water. So it's really a low maintenance crop. The most proud plant I have in the garden right now is actually not an edible plant, although you can eat, I think, any rose. I just probably opt not to. This is the Cecile Bruner Rose Arch. It is in full bloom right now. Never, ever looked better. I mean, come on, guys. That is just one of the more gorgeous things you'll ever see. Pretty proud. I'm a bit of an aesthetic gardener now. Back here in the onion barrel zone, I've sort of had mixed success with these barrels in general. This time, because the onions are wanting to bulb a little bit too early. So you can see where we've cut that flower bulb off. So if you didn't know, onions are a biennial crop, meaning year one, they're gonna throw up green growth and they're gonna bulb. That's when we eat them. But if you let them go, year two, they're gonna throw up a flower stalk and then they're going to actually flower, produce seed, and thus carries on the circle of life. But in this case, sometimes onions can get a little bit confused because they're very sensitive to daylight hours. You have long day, medium day, short day onions. And in this case, I think something happened here where these onions got a little confused and they said, uh-oh, I guess I'm a biennial now. I'll go ahead and throw up a flower. So I'll show you one right now and exactly what we're doing to prevent this problem. But really it's not so much prevention, it's more like treatment and prey because once you see it you kind of have to hope that the onion resets itself so there's a really good example of it you see this little flower bud right here the only thing you can do at this point you can't like magically make it not do this anymore you just have to cut it off so all i've done is just cut right there and you can see the plant will continue to grow because this is an area that we cut earlier and we cut it at like that point right there so it's still grown but what i'm concerned about is i, I don't want to not see any bulbing. I want it to bulb up and I'm just not quite seeing that yet. So I'm hoping that because I'm seeing this sort of flower stalk coming out, it doesn't mean that the bulbing has completely stopped. On some of these other ones, it does seem like it still has continued to bulb up like this one right here or, or this one right here. So I don't know, we're gonna have to see, but if you see a problem like that with your onions, that would be my advice. But with every garden loss comes garden success. And what we have here is just this boatload of new plants that we're gonna be putting in, including a tree. So this is all going in the Epic Pond, which we have started to landscape a little bit, but man, we've got some isotoma, we have some thyme, we have some ornamental strawberries, some California natives, as well as just some nice sages and shrubs. All of this is gonna come around and be worked into this area right here. So right about here, we're going to break this ground up add a little bit more ground cover. I actually have this bench here that's in memorial of my dad, but it's just a really peaceful place. So what I wanna do is beautify this area, put a couple of shrubs right there and right there, framing that bench and clearing out that area. So it like looks, looks really, really nice. We'll smooth all of this out here. This feather grass is looking gorgeous. Look at that, I mean, come on. Honestly, it kind of feels like hair, almost like a, like a fluffy pet. If I'm close up, can you tell this isn't a pet? Because to me, it looks like one. But what we're gonna do is come in, place a tree here. We'll put another tree probably somewhere around here. And we're gonna do more ground cover here, more shrubbery here. We're gonna take a couple more of these flagstones, go one flagstone there, boom. And then come up this pathway right here and then landscape around this with some medium height stuff. Cause I don't wanna block off the passion fruit that we have growing here. It's taken a little slower to start than I would have liked but basically gonna beautify this entire pond area. Because what we effectively have right now is this absolutely gorgeous, natural looking pond with a very unnatural landscape around it. It doesn't really fit in. What we've done is pick some amazing landscaping plants with Sarah Bendrick and some local nurseries and trying to create a space that feels natural. It's not all California native, but there are a lot of California natives in here. I've noticed a lot of wildlife coming in, mammals, birds, insects, etc. If I add more around this landscape to make it look and feel like a natural pond, I'm gonna see even more of that life come in. And that life not only brings a lot of beauty to the garden, I was sitting out here with my girlfriend, we were just enjoying some dinner, and there was like a five hummingbird battle going on right down there at the pond return. It was an incredible sight, just like little entertainment from nature itself. We're gonna do that and then maybe even think about adding a pergola in this area which we can grow grapes over so we have some shade in the entertaining zone right here but then we have natural landscape over here and going on back because there used to be a big hole there we filled the hole in and i think that means there's a lot of space in the ground to create a beautiful backdrop because i'll show you you want to look and solve for that eye line when it comes to the pond and really any garden space. So I'll show you the eye line right now and you'll kind of see what I mean by it looking a little bit drab. So imagine you're coming into the garden, you say, ooh, nice greenhouse, ooh, beautiful. You've got this beautiful garden over here, coop, etc." 
Then you turn this way and you say, oh, look at this amazing pond patio area. But then when you look beyond it, you just see nothing. There's nothing to kind of stop the eye. In this area here, in this area here, you got a little bit of that feather grass doing that. There's no bench there, there's no shrubbery there, no back of that landscape. Higher textures, different colors, lower textures. And so, you know, this blank area right here, I'd love to block that cistern off a little bit more. And of course, have something wrapping around up here, making it feel very lush and filled in. And so I am trying to get more into that landscaping. A few struggles, a few failures, but a lot of cool stuff coming here at the homestead. It's the beginning of the season for a lot of you. So I'm really curious. Let me know what your biggest struggle is this year in the garden or in your homesteading journey. Comment down below. Really want to hear from you guys. Love hearing from you guys. And until next time, good luck in the garden and keep on growing.